And it says this hangout is on air now. So we are live. Thank you so much for being here, Jordan. And um, Hello. <laughs> we're gonna just give it a few moments <coughs> to see who comes into the chat. I always like to give it just a few moments and we're going to, we're going to uh, talk about physics, gravitational waves and particles and touch a little bit on quantum computing, you know, all of the stuff that I just like to say the words because they are big fancy words and I have <laughs> no understanding of the meaning of these words, but that word quantum is so cool. So it's a very fun word. Yes, it is. Quantum computing, quantum mechanics, quantum entanglement. Uh, oh, there's also an energy healing called quantum touch. Have you heard of quantum touch? I haven't, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we are getting some people into the chat room. Welcome, Lee. Lee is one of my longtime viewers and friend. I adore that Lee Veltman. Anywho, so <laughs> let's go ahead and get started. We have a few people in the chat room and I'm gonna go ahead and invite everyone to take a nice deep centering breath as we enter into this sacred space. Okay, welcome, welcome everyone. I, and you know, anyone who's watched my shows long enough and I've been doing this since um, August of 2017, knows that I am pretty, usually pretty excited about my guests, very excited about each and every one of my guests because everyone is unique. They have a very unique and interesting story to tell. And my guest this evening has a very unique and interesting place in my heart. So for those of you who have watched me long enough, know that I'm a mother. I'm a mother of four, four sons. And this evening, I have my second born son uh, on. Uh, his name is Jordan. He is a senior at Tufts University in the physics program. And uh, finally, he's ready to give his mother the time of day because he just recently, this past week, uh, successfully defended his senior thesis. And so now I guess his schedule has cleared up and he's ready to come onto the show and talk about all things physics. So I would like to extend a wonderful heart warming, heartfelt welcome to my beloved son, Jordan. <laughs> Just, <laughs> there he is. Welcome, Jordan. Here, let me bring the screen over to you. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> I'm happy to have you on as well. And um, I'm going to do a screen share right quick, just to show the audience the title of your thesis that you presented if that's okay. Sure, of course. So, okay, so what I'm gonna do first is, let me see if I can do a screen share of, let's see, do, 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 do. So I'm gonna do a screen share of your actual presentation of your thesis and which I was, um, let's see, there we go. Let me present to all. Can everyone see that? There we go. So this is the image that you sent me. And, and I was so happy and thankful that you did send me. I guess you sent it a couple of hours after your presentation. And I really appreciate that. And um, let's see. So I'm going to switch the screen over to the title of your presentation, which is Producing Microscopic Behaviors of the Free Electron Model Using in body Monte Carlo simulations by Jay Kemp. So Jordan, 
if you don't mind, if you could, you know, give us sort of like the synopsis of the synopsis of what your <laughs> senior thesis, you know, like make it really sort of brief yeah, yeah. what your yeah, senior yeah. thesis is on. And also I like to say, I don't know if I mentioned it before, uh, Jordan is due to graduate Tufts University in a couple of weeks. And uh, he, in the fall, he will be attending uh, University of Chicago in the quantum uh, computing department. Anyway, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your your thesis, senior thesis. Sure. Yeah. So, for the last couple hundred years, uh, a lot of physics has been split between people who do experiments um, in like physical laboratories, and then people who you know sit at a chalkboard all day and derive formulas for how the world behaves. Um, but with the invention of the computers in the past century, that's opened up this whole new territory of studying physics because now <clears throat> we can do thousands and millions of computations per second. This opens up a whole new avenue of ways to solve problems that, you know, pose a really difficult challenge for, you know, these pencil and paper theorists. And so this whole field, field of computer simulations to do physics, you know, kind of became a popular method. And my experiences, and we can get into this a little bit more later, with physics have been mostly lab work. And so for my senior thesis, <clears throat> I wanted to Sorry, <clears throat> I wanted to try, you know, this uh, computer simulating to do physics. And that's, uh, and this thesis is the end product of that. And so um, we can try to unpack this title together okay. if you'd like. Okay. Um, and so really quickly, what the free electron model is, and we'll start with that, is this model that was developed a hundred years ago, roughly, that explains how com or how electrical circuits work. You know how these particles called electrons can travel through metals, um, and like how can electricity conduct? Um, and if anybody would like a copy of the thesis, it, it explains it. It explains how that model works. Um, but that is essentially what you know the simulation is about. And so what I wanted to focus on with the simulation is how can we you know, reproduce what the equations tell us um, by using what are called, what's called an n-body simulation. And what that is essentially is um, we are doing individual operations on little electrons. Okay. And then as, you know, as individual microscopic bodies, these electrons behave, you know, one way. But if we look at how all of the electrons are behaving together, we get an entirely different um, behavior. Um, and so the part that says, can we pull the, the title back up? Okay, hold on one moment. Let me get to that title. Share screen. Okay, hold on one second. Yeah. Um, so we have pr producing the macroscopic behavior. And so that's, you know, seeing the behavior of these little electrons on a large scale um, using N body, you know, that's many, many bodies uh, of electrons, Monte Carlo simulation. Now, Monte Carlo, um, a Monte Carlo simulation is essentially one that uses a lot of randomness and probability to actually do the simulation. And this free electron model um, essentially is, you know, a set of rules that these electrons um, behave by, where they just randomly bounce around inside of this piece of metal. And that random bouncing, in order to simulate that, we have to use this Monte Carlo class of simulations, where we are programming random behavior. And so that's essentially what the title means. I basically just did, I, I simulated electrons randomly bouncing around. Um, and then when we apply some forces to these electrons, we can see how their behavior sort of mimics how electrons in a circuit behaves. Oh, okay. And yeah, so does that, does that make sense? Yes, okay, so I have a couple of questions. Yep. Where does the term Monte Carlo come from? Because- That's a cool question, yeah. Car. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a city in, somewhere in Europe. It's it's one of the city states called Monte Carlo, and they have, I believe, a, the name comes from that that city. They have a lot of uh, casinos. Okay. And just oh. because, yeah, yeah, and so. So the casino my, wheel, the wheel, unlike the blackjack table, is that what you mean? Um, I'm not exactly sure what Monte like what specifically, um, it is, but. Um, just because, you know, ga gambling is uh, inherently just a lot of probability, a lot of luck, a lot of, you know, chance. 
you know, any, they decided to call the class of simulations that relies on that kind of process, Monte Carlo. Okay. All right. And what does N stand for? So in, in math science, uh, in like physics and computer science, anytime you have, you know, a large number of objects, but you don't know exactly how many objects you have, okay. they will substitute N. Uh, and N just means like number. So like many, so it just really means many body. Okay. And the body refers to the amount of electrons that are being simulated. Okay. And so my other question would be what type of metal, what was the metal that you were simulating or what would be the metal that you would use? Um, so it's just any kind of metal. Most metals, um, they behave like their, their, um, behavior is they're similar between metals, just the exact numbers of their behavior, like how fast does do electrons travel? You know, that's what's different, but the mechanism by which those electrons travel is the same. Um, yeah. Okay. And why would you, why did you choose this thesis? Yeah. Why is this important in either in school or just in the world of physics? Why is this important? So at Tufts, I work with uh, a professor named uh, Professor Roger Tobin, and him and his grad student, uh, their uh, research involves looking at how very thin pieces of metal behave. Okay. Uh, when, you, when you basically scratch the surface of them, when you deposit things on the surface, um, and what the theory tells us is that if the, the crystal, if the metal crystal is sufficiently small, you will have, um, it'll basically not conduct as well. Um, and the mechanisms behind that are described by the theory that I talk about in this paper. And so this applies to the real world because, you know, now that computers technology is becoming so tiny, you know, it's important to understand how metals behave at those very tiny length scales. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so I have a question from Lee Veltman, and he asks, would fiber optics behave different or be different from metal circuits? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So fiber optics are this very cool way of uh, communication. Um, okay. If you think about like telephone wires, about like telegram, yeah, um, those are those do communication by conducting electrons through like a thin metal wire, right? And um, Jordan. You would hold that for a second. I just want to let you know, in case you didn't know this, your Nana used to work for AT&T mm -hmm. uh, 30 years ago, and she made the fiber optics. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Yes. Nice. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so anyhow, so, um, that, so that's one way of sending signals over a long distance is just conducting electrons. But electrons right. don't travel that fast, you know? Um, you know, it takes a few seconds to get from like Boston to New York. That's a still, a, yeah, that's still a very fast speed, but we can go at even faster if we use lights. And so these fiber optic cables are essentially, they have these pieces of glass that are inside of, like they're just wrapped in like insulation and they shoot lasers through that wire. Right. And so that allows communication at light speed, which is significantly faster than electron electron travel. So instead of communicating over seconds, we're communicating over, you know, micro nanoseconds, which are, you know, a couple thousand times smaller. Okay. Is there anything smaller than a nanosecond? Oh yeah. <laughs> there's <laughs> so there's there's this whole uh scale. I can actually pull it up for you quick if you want. Okay, yeah. Just do the screen share. Yeah. So there's um uh Oh, and make sure when you do the screen share to present to everyone. Yeah, There's of course. Button there. Yeah, so this is actually a very great segue into things we're going to talk about later. Um, okay, cool. And so can you see that well? I, I can see it. Is there any way to make it the image a little bit bigger? Yeah. And when, when you finish with that, Lee wants to know about quarks. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. He doesn't even know what so they are. So can you see that well? Uh, yeah. Should I yeah, zoom in more? Let's see if you're, yeah, if you're able to. Okay, well, no, go back down because then it cuts the graphic off. So yeah, that, okay. that'll be fine enough. So. Okay. I'm sorry, go ahead, I can see so it. This, is, this diagram shows all of the different length scales. So that's um, Planck length on the left-hand side and then the universe on the right yeah, hand side. Yeah, and so that 10 to the 26 means, or so let's start with the people. 
So that's okay. 10 to the zero meters. Um, that means our length scale is one meter. Um, if we get a little larger, we see trees, we see you know oceans. It's, these are becoming 10 times as large, 1,000 times as large. We get to the planets, that's a few thousand times larger. Um, and you keep going up that way, you got galaxies, which are a few million times. And then after that, it just gets so immensely huge. So that 10 to the 26 means there's 26 zeros after that 10 oh, meters. Okay. Okay. And that's an immense distance. And so that's kind of how it goes in the positive direction. And then if we look in the other direction, you know, we have grass, which is like 100 times smaller than us, cells, 1,000, you know, and we keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Down to, um, down to atoms, mm -hmm. um, quarks, and then Planck length. And um, so just by the scale that this works, um, you know, atoms are roughly, you know, a few thousand times smaller than cells. Quarks are a few thousand times smaller than atoms. And then a few, like, uh, you know, 10 to the 20, 20 times smaller than that is the Planck length. Um, so you ask, you know, it, it, you asked if something was like the smallest length. Oh, you mm -hmm. asked if nano, nano. So nano uh, is, is a nanometer. Nano? Okay. Nanometer is around right here, around DNA. Okay. Um, between cells and DNA. And okay. so you can see that's still like uh, about 25, 26 orders of magnitude. So that's 26 zeros larger than the Planck length, which is the smallest length allowed by uh, physics. Okay. So, it's not, so to answer your question in short, uh, the answer is it's very, very much larger than the smallest thing. Okay, so, a net, so there is something smaller than a nanosecond. There are many, many, many things smaller. That, okay, wait a minute. These many, many things smaller than a nanosecond, can they actually be quantified? Yeah. Yeah, and that's exactly what this <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's that's exactly what this Planck length describes. That's describing the smallest length that you could possibly quantify. Um beyond that, I don't know the specifics. I don't know why it exists, but I just know that that's kind of a a, a thing in physics. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Thanks for sharing that diagram. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So where were we? So you were, go ahead. Oh, so yeah. So what the, my professor Tobin's research involves is, you know, looking at how metals behave on this nanometer scale. And that's because, you know, a lot of computer electronics have pieces of metal that, that are that size. And so it's important to understand how they behave, you know, if they have defects on them, if they have you know, things messing with its surface so that we can understand that. So when we make computers, you know, we can predict pretty accurately how they behave. Okay. All right. Very cool. Very cool. So, all right. Okay. So off the top of my head, let's see. Uh, is there, oh, I know what. Okay. So we were just talking about, we were just talking about your thesis producing macroscopic behaviors of the free form of the free electron model using in-body Monte Carlo simulations. And these were computer simulations that you did. Uh, you know, I'm kind of interested in learning about your experience in four years of undergrad in physics. Like, you know, when, when you first started, did you have any idea of what realm of physics you wanted to go into? You know, what was your inspiration for deciding that? Or did it just take you a while and experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I did not go into undergrad knowing which part of physics I wanted to study. Um, I just knew that, you know, I grew up watching physics documentaries, you know, sort of you know, I had a video game that I played where what the main character was a theoretical physics or a physicist, and I really enjoyed science class. So I just knew that, you know, physics was a field that I really enjoyed. And so, you know, I, I wasn't, it didn't really matter at the time which field I wanted to get into. I would just, you know, sort of see how it went. Um, and so I took some introductory courses. Um, I eventually met this professor who I asked to do research with him. I didn't know what research he did. I just, you know, I knew I wanted to do something. And it turns out that he does, you know, this, the physics that we've been talking about. Um, and so two summers ago, the summer of 2016, I worked for him in his lab. Um, and I was working with these, you know, small pieces of metal, you know, playing in what are called vacuum chambers where we essentially suck out all of the air. So there's not, there's no gases, you know, uh, corroding the pieces of metal. And then we just play with the surfaces. We, 
you know, deposit other metals on top and we shoot lasers at it to see what's going on. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so then after that experience, I had the incredible fortune of working for, for LIGO. LIGO. Um, and we can okay. talk about that in a bit. Okay. Um, and that's, uh, and so I went to uh, Caltech last summer and did research with that group. They study gravitational waves. They recently won the Nobel prize. And so that was an incredible, fortunate, incredibly fortunate experience to have. Um, and by the time I became a senior, you know, I knew at that point I wanted to study quantum computing because um, I did dabble a little bit of computer in a computer science as an undergrad. And mm -hmm. so I knew I wanted to kind of combine physics and computer science. Okay. Uh, the two ways to do that are through, you know, doing these simulations that we just talked about and then also exploring this field of quantum computing. And I haven't really done that. I haven't really looked or done research in quantum computing yet, but I know I'm interested in it. So I look forward to like, you know, starting that next year. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of my journey. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty, but, um, you know, I kind of found my place and yeah. So. That is really awesome. That's really awesome. Um, so when it comes to physics, and you know, right here, we'll stop right here for a second and say you wanted to inspire the younger generation that's coming up behind you. What words of wisdom would you offer someone in either middle school or high school who inspires to go to college and, and major in physics? That's a great question. I would say, um, if you've had, because usually the, the biggest reason why people don't go into physics um, is because of the math and the math, you know, is, it's intimidating. And actually, when I first, first started school, that was a big concern of mine was whether or not I could actually handle it because, you know, I wasn't that great at math in high school. Um, but it takes a lot of, you know, it's, it's challenging, but it can be done. And there's a, there's a growing support network available. So my advice would be to you know, don't let yourself get intimidated. If you've had bad experiences with teachers, just know that there's many more wonderful people out there to help you if you're, if you're struggling. And just know that it's a very rewarding field. You know, the, the excitement of making these discoveries, you know, of how magnets work, of how gravitational waves work is really, really exciting. And there's a lot of exciting research going on. So many cool things going on that it's, it's worth the, the challenges that, you know, can be thrown at you. Um, and so, you know, what got me interested, like I said, was watching those documentaries, sort of seeing the great sides, the rewarding sides, and then letting that motivate you. Um, but it is it is challenging, but it can be done. And there's, like I said, a, a growing support network. You know, a lot of people investing time into, you know, expanding the accessibility of physics, you know, working on physics outreach. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the community there to help you out. So just, yeah, just stay dedicated and don't let yourself get you know, too beat up about the challenge because everybody, everybody struggles with it at first. You know, very few people just walk through the door and, you know, know what's going on. Um, so, yeah. Right. Okay. You mentioned gravitational something. Gravitational so, waves. Yeah. Yeah. So if you could go back and take us to LIGO, yeah. first tell us what is LIGO Voyager and yeah. then tell us how did you end up as an intern or yeah. research fellow, yeah. Yeah. all of that. Yeah, so LIGO is this crazy research group that started about 40 years ago. Um, and the goal of their research is, is to discover or to observe what are, what are called gravitational waves. And gravitational waves have a very long history. Um, gravity itself has a very long and mysterious history um, that I can go into if you'd like. Yes. Um, but, you know, essentially we had, there's actually a faculty member at Tufts uh, in the 60s who was kind of like in the core group of LIGO uh, uh, during its origin period. Um, he actually, he's one of the, the recipients of the Nobel Prize. His name is Rainer Weiss. Rainer. Um, and so last year he gave this talk at, at Tufts. This was about a year after LIGO made the discovery. Okay. And so I attended that talk and I was like, wow, this is incredible stuff. And so I looked online, saw they had an internship program. I applied. Okay. And so I was fortunate enough to be selected for it. And um, 
So yeah, should I go into like how, what LIGO is, how it works? Oh yes, definitely. What is LIGO? Okay. And oh, but but before you go into that, what was the process like? Did you have questions that you had to ask for the applicant um, answer for the application? What exactly was the process? How did they pick you? Oh, so I mean, it was just like like many other internship apps. It's like you know, what do you want to study? Uh, what do you like about physics? I don't know. It, it's yeah, it was just questions like that, just to gauge my interests, my personality, like, you know, mm -hmm. and talk about my experiences as a physicist. And then we had an interview over Skype. And then, yeah, that was basically it. Right. So, okay. All right. It's, okay. So what is LIGO? L-I-G-O. Okay. What is LIGO? Yeah. So LIGO is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Okay. Wait a minute. Hold on. Laser. Did you say infrotometer? In interferometer. Interferometer. Okay. Yeah, gr gravitational wave observatory. And so that's that. It's a big word. It's a big uh, acronym. So we can sort of break it down. Okay. And we'll start with gravitational waves because that is, you know, the whole crux of you know what the research group does. Um, and so we'll start with uh, you know gravity. What is it? Um, and everybody's heard of you know. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton and his experience with the apple falling on his head and having that eureka moment that bodies are attracted to each other um, because this apple that fell on his head was attracted, it was pulled down by the earth and it hit him. And then at the same rate, we are all held to the earth by gravity. You know, it's what prevents us from just jumping into space and, you know, flying away. Um, and so gravity, you know, while it, it is, you know, this very dominating part of our lives, you know, it keeps us on the earth. It also just happens to be a very, poorly understood force okay. and that's because it's such a weak force. And just to make my point, if you compare, you know, how big the earth is right. compared to how, you know, weak of a pull, a pull it has on you. Like I can jump just with my little legs. I can overcome gravity for a little bit, right. the gravity output by the entire earth. And that mm -hmm. just shows how weak gravity is compared to like a magnet, which, you know, you have a magnet that big and it can pick up a screwdriver. Right. Right. And so the the scales of these forces are of gravity compared to other forces like electricity and magnetism is so weak. Um, and so to study gravity experimentally, we need massive bodies um, okay. such as the Earth, such as grab, uh, galaxies out in space. And so compared to other forces in physics, it's a very poorly understood um, force. And so uh, in the early 1900s, um, Albert Einstein did a lot of research into the behavior of gravity. Um, he developed this theory called the theory of general relativity, um, which tells us essentially that gravity is mm -hmm. the warping of space time. Gravity so, is the warping of space, space time. time. Okay. And so I can show you I can show you a picture of what exactly this means. Okay. Um, okay. And so do you see the picture on the screen? Yes. Okay. And so I'll start with this grid that we're seeing on the screen. Okay. And you see everywhere where these bodies aren't, the space is flat. Yeah. This represents space. Space is flat. And that means, you know, if you take, you know, a patch of space here and a patch of patch of space here, you know, right. they have the same length. Um, right. yeah. But if you go around one of these big bodies, they represent like the sun, the earth, the moon. Mm -hmm. You know, we see that this space is no longer straight now. It's no longer flat. There's curvature in the mm -hmm. space and you see like right around here space is uh you know it's kind of stretched downward okay and because it's stretched downward that means horizontally it's kind of compressed a little bit because now we're fitting more space into a smaller horizontal area um and so what that is telling us is these bodies such as the earth the moon the sun they cause space time to kind of compress um and that's a, a huge notion to kind of wrap your head around because what that essentially tells us is now space isn't always flat. Okay. Space kind of changes its shape depending on what it's around. And, and um, so I don't know if you've been to a science center where they have um, one of those little, they have this, those big bowls where you can sort of roll a coin right. and the coin will kind of spin around and around and around, okay. right? And that's those, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. So those are actually, the way that that coin spins around. Right. 
is how objects um, that are under the influence of gravity behave. Okay. Um, because if you, for example, go back to this picture quick, if you could imagine pushing a ball like into the space right here, mm -hmm. we can zoom in onto that. Uh, pushing a ball, you can imagine it going around and around this curved space because it's basically like a bowl, right? Right. And as that little ball goes down further, it gives off energy as friction. You know, in the case of a penny in a bowl, it'll give off friction, it'll slow down until it eventually collides with the earth and then now it's kind of stuck to it, right? Okay, so my very lay lay woman's mind, <laughs> when you tell me that space can curve, yeah, so that's telling me that space. What I'm thinking is space is not empty; that it's a mm -hmm. thing, that there's something there, that yeah, you know, well, there's mesh or there's something because something is curving. Yeah, so that's um, that notion kind of falls under metaphysics, which is kind of outside of the realm of physics because okay. you know it's kind of something that we don't have the capacity yet to understand. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of physics is explaining how things work and not why it works because you know at the end of the day, it's you can't run experiments that tell you why things work. You can only tell you know how it works. And so, what exactly is curving? You know, okay. we don't know. All we know is that the space that we exist in isn't flat and constant at all places like we used to think it was. Mm -hmm. um, and so with this, and so why, you know, why it's called the theory of general relativity is because, you know, ignoring general, just focusing on relativity, relative to a space out here, the space around the planet or the sun is curved. Mm. Um, and so if you're on that flat space, you know, you look around, everything looks flat, so you can't tell you know, what the curvature is. If you're like in this curved spot here, everything around you is curved. So you don't know, you know, whether it's curved or not because everything relative to you is also the state that you're in. Right. You know, the, the analogy to that is the only way that you can tell that a car is going at 50 miles an hour is because relative to that car, you're going zero miles an hour. You're going, sorry, right. you're going min you're going 50 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, All right. And so, like, if you're, uh, if you're also traveling 50 miles an hour, Mm -hmm. Relative to that car, you're not moving, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And right. so that's where the relativity comes in, because okay. depending on where you are in space time, the curvature of the space around you is going to look different. Mm. Right. And so, so this ties in. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. So, like for instance, if you're further away from the object, you're mm -hmm. able to actually witness the curvature. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and then at the but at the same rate, you can't the space that's around you, you have a harder time of telling whether or not it's curved because you, your space is, you're sharing that space with the space around you, essentially. Yes, so right. we, we had a comment from one of our guests that I just wanted to share. Uh, Speculum Nin Nish says that you're good at conveying uh, this kind of information. You, Jordan, are good at conveying this kind of information in a way that is easy to follow. Uh, is a talent, and uh, she says, I can see him being a great professor and any other occasion for public speaking in general. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and only because I know you, and I've known you, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You popped into this existence. <laughs> uh, you, you've always been good at, at public you. speaking, and um, yeah, so, all that yeah, good stuff. So let's, let's get back to the, uh, let's get back to gravitational <laughs> waves. <laughs> So, I'm so anyhow, sorry, I was having a proud mom moment. I, yeah, 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 yeah. But so, anyway, so, um, okay, so LIGO, laser, and then there was this big word you said, infradermal. Interferometer. So I'll get back to that in a second. Okay, um, all right. So a big result of this, you know, theory of relativity was, you know, now that we understand how gravity, you know, inter how gravity um looks like you know it looks like this curvature now it's a matter of how does gravity like actually travel you know um, gravity travels well sorry how does gravity how do i feel gravity when i'm super far away oh, okay. okay um and so if you back at the time of newton gravity was thought to just be instantaneous um so for example if the sun were to just suddenly disappear we would just instantaneously 
fly off into space. You know, now we're no longer orbiting around anything, so we'll just fly off right away. Um, physics tells us that if the sun were to like suddenly disappear, that wouldn't happen because you know, information, whether it be in the form of gravity or light, travels at the speed of at this maximum speed limit of the universe that is the speed of light. Right. Um, but anyhow, so the question that came up then was does gravity travel as waves or does it travel as particles? Okay. Um, and so, and so what does that mean? Um, what does it mean to travel as a wave? Um, and so when we say wave, I mean, literally the first thing that you think about when I think of a wave, like a water wave or sound waves. Right. Um, and the way that waves behave is if we consider, you know, dropping two balls into, you know, very calm water, um, you'll see that the wave starts to, or the water starts to ripple. Um, and that ripple, ripple in the water is carrying, you know, some kinetic energy outward. You know, if you get hit by a wave, you feel that force, right? Right. Um, but a characteristic of a wave is this sort of, we call it an oscillation up and down. Um, and so you see like these ripples in the water going up and down, right? Right. And so you drop that ball into the water. You right. can watch that wave sort of propagate outwards. And you don't feel the wave until it hits you. You can see it coming, but you can't, you don't feel it until it hits you, right? Right. And so for gravity to behave like a wave would behave in that same way, where that grab that wave of gravity, that gravity, which we'll get to in a little bit, mm -hmm. you won't feel that until it actually, you know, contacts you. Mm -hmm. Um and because uh sorry, so uh and so a feature of what we call wave mechanics is how these waves behave, is that when you have two waves that come at each other and they collide with each other. They don't bounce off each other. Um, instead, they, they do what's called interfering. Oh, okay. Um, and so if you think about how do waves, when you see two water waves come at each other, if you have two crests, right. you know, two peaks of the wave hit each other, they will double in size and get twice as large as they pass through each other. And then they sort of, you know, go back to relaxing, right? Right. And then if you have two dips in the water that hit each other, they get even deeper. They, you know, you have that addition of the wave behavior. And if you have a top, you have a peak and a crest, um, and they hit each other, they cancel out. And then for an instant, there's no wave there. Right. right. Um, and so uh, that's how all different kinds of waves behave. If you, have you heard of uh, noise canceling headphones? Yes, but I'm still so trying way, to figure out how those work. <laughs> so the, the way that noise canceling headphones work is they put little microphones inside the headphones so that they can detect the audio waves that are coming in. Okay. And they, the headphones shoot out a wave that, that will deconstruct that, or sorry, that interferes with that wave destructively and oh. cancels it out right around your ear. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right? Wait a, wow. Yeah. And so what that tells us is that like waves, no matter what their form, they all behave the same way. You know, water waves can cancel out, sound waves can cancel out. Okay, so wait a minute. So wait a minute. Okay, so you're saying that sound canceling head uh, headsets yeah. they they detect the waves coming to you and they quit kind of send out like say like a microsonic boom to attack those waves to keep them from hitting your eardrums. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. That is freaking. I. I. You know. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I, I no, just, it's fine. This is why yeah, this is I'm why so you study physics because it has these mind blowing moments, you know, that are really. And, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. another mind blowing moment that I have, and I'm sorry, this might embarrass you for a second. There is when I have when I look at my children and I see them explain the world to me that I could not <laughs> figure out on my own. That is yeah, just like yeah. poof, mind blown. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and so what I have uh, on the screen now okay. is, a, is a picture of what I'm describing. Um, there's some echo right now in your mic. All right. Um, All right. Let's see. Okay, I'll turn my mic off. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, an example of this, this wave addition that I was talking about, if you look at the top part of this diagram here, we have what's called in phase, where you have two waves. Um, that where one has a dip, the other has a dip, where the other has a peak, or where one has a peak, the other has a peak, right? And so they're considered to be in phase um, because the phase at every point of the wave, they match up. And so when those waves hit each other, they construct to form an even larger wave, a wave that is twice as big. But when they're, when they're completely out of phase, uh, where one wave has a dip, the other has a peak, 
where one has a peak, the other has a dip, they will completely cancel out and you won't see any wave there. Um, sorry, you're, you're, you're muted. And that means you won't hear anything. You won't hear anything, yeah. It completely yeah. cancels out. Yeah. Okay. Wow. All right. And so, so the way that LIGO works is that if gravity behaves as a wave, and I'll pull up a picture showing what that means, um, then we should be able to use that um, sort of technique of shooting, of hitting waves at each other to detect them. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, and um, you mentioned LIGO, LIGO Voyager again. And LIGO, uh, they have two headquarters, right? They have I'll, one I'll get that. I'll get to that in a second. I need, to, I, okay. I'm almost through. Okay. Um, anyhow, so right, what I'm showing here is two bodies, two, uh, they look, I guess they look like little stars. Um, this is a simulation of stars sort of spinning around each other. Um, and because if we look back to this diagram here, we have that little, uh, you know, sort of dip in space time. As we move this ball around, we'll expect that dip to kind of fan out a bit, like we see here. And as these bodies are spinning around each other, um, because they're, you know, they're gravitationally locked, so they're spinning around each other, they're going to cause these ripples in space time to sort of shoot out of, out of them as waves. Um, and you can sort, sort of simulate this yourself if you, you know, stuck two fingers in water and sort of swirled it around each other, you would see this exact same pa pattern like form in the water as these waves sort of, you know, fan out. And so these are gravitation waves. These are physically what they are. There's these ripples in space time that sort of come out of these, you know, very massively rotating bodies. Um, and so what LIGO does is they try to detect these using what's called uh, laser interferometry. Um, and uh, an interferometer is, you know, this big device that essentially tries to cause this, these wave interactions. And I'll, I'll pull up that picture again, just as a recap. So what laser interferometry does is it takes, um, uh, you take a laser beam and you shine it in two directions perpendicularly. Um, I'll actually, I'll show the diagram of that actually, one second. Um, one second. Uh, this is a good picture. Okay. Uh, can you see that well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so what LIGO is, is they have this interferometer. This is what an interferometer looks like. Okay. Uh, you have this laser source down here in the bottom left that will shoot a laser out. And this laser, a light beam is, you know, this up and down oscillation of light. And so that hits what's called a beam splitter, which will cause this light beam to split into two light or beams of light and travel down these long arms, bounce off of a mirror, and then they recombine at this beam splitter okay. and then hit this light detector. Oh, wow. Okay. So the beam splitter, is that like a prism or is that just a piece of glass, an oval shaped glass or what? Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I think a prism is like a good way to describe it. Okay. Right. Um, because it splits and prisms do split. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so, yeah. And so, um, so when we shoot those, we, we shoot those lasers down those two arms, they hit the mirror, they come back. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, depending on how long those mirrors are, we can get the laser, the light to shoot back into that detector, either in phase so that they construct into this bigger wave or out of phase so that you don't, you don't see any signal. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay. And so when this detector is just sitting, there's no gravitation coming through, um, the, the mirrors are situated so that when that light combines, it's totally canceling out itself. Um, and so we don't see a signal, but when this gravitational wave comes through and remember that's these ripples in space time that cause space to contract and expand, you're going to cause one of those arms to the distance of one of the arms to increase and decrease. Right. And now you're kind of playing with the phase of that, that one arm, um, while you're, you're not messing with the phase of this arm. And so what happens is what 
la what recombined laser that used to be completely out of phase is now sort of in phase. And you see sort of a signal start to ripple in and out of existence. And so that's how the, the interferometer works. Uh, yeah. All right. And you mentioned that LIGO, was it LIGO Caltech or LIGO MIT? You mentioned yeah, yeah. LIGO won a Nobel Prize. What yeah. did it win a Nobel Prize for? Yeah, so LIGO, like I said, it, it started about 40 years ago um, building this detector. And it took so long because the detector has to be so sensitive because these gravitational waves, um, the target source that they want to detect them from are uh, colliding black holes. And black holes are, you know, a few times larger than the sun. Um, right. So they're super, super large, like insanely massive. And these, you know, large merging black holes produce a gravitational wave signal. Um, and that signal is so tiny that, that it causes ripples in space time that are, you know, less than an atom, you know, less variation. Is it less? Not, not less than a quark, but like less than an atom. Uh, so the shrinking that it causes is so, so tiny. That means that they have to make this detector super, super sensitive. Okay. And it just, it took them that long to do that. Um, what was the purpose of they're trying to detect gravitational waves emanating from black holes? Yeah. So they, so they wanted to just prove that these, these waves exist because Einstein predicted that they existed, but we've never seen them before um, because they're so tiny and so weak. And so their, their whole purpose was to develop a, a detector sensitive enough to detect these, these ripples in space time. Yeah. Oh. And so it was just a huge moment in physics when they actually made that detection because, you know, that shows, oh, hey, like gravity does travel as waves. Okay. Um, which we weren't entirely sure of. And yeah, it was just an incredible moment for uh, physics, for experimental physics. Yeah. And that was for what? That was back in what, January 2016? That so the, the detection happened in the summer of 2015. 2015, okay. Wait. Yeah, or I think it was, no, September of 2015, I think. That's when the detection was. Right, yeah. right. And since then, they've detected, I think, four or five black holes merging. They've detected uh, very dense stars merging. Um, and so the field is just... It's opening this whole new field of astronomy because before, you know, for the past couple hundred years, when we look to the stars, you know, all that all that we see is just light coming from the stars. That's the only way that oh, the only way that we know that the stars are there. Um, you know, because we can't listen to the stars because sound doesn't travel through space. You know, we can't you know necessarily feel the heat because they're you know they're so far away, right? But we can see the light that comes out of them. Um, but now we know that we can also see the gravitational waves that come from them. And so that opens up this new field that's called multi-messenger astronomy. And that is looking at these um, astronomical events with diff through different media, such as through their light emissions, through their gravitation wave emissions. And so this was a huge moment for astronomy because now we can look at you know, the night sky with essentially a different pair of goggles on. Oh, okay. Um, and that was you know, really, really exciting. And so they won a Nobel Prize for that uh, this past year. Um, yeah. Okay. And so the, the, sorry. So the research group is based in at MIT and Caltech, and they have some uh, other groups at other universities throughout oh. the America. Uh -huh. uh, now there's this whole international community. Um, they have a gravitational wave detector in Germany and in Italy. Um, sorry, uh, I think in Italy. Yeah, they have one in Japan. They're thinking about putting a really large one out in space. Um, yeah. So. It's a, this, this very rapidly improving field, rapidly expanding field, yeah. Okay, well, I had a question because I was confused by something that you just said. Mm -hmm. You said something about we can't listen to stars or something yeah. like that because yeah. there's okay. sound in space, yeah. but uh, groups like C SETI or whatever, aren't they trying to listen to hear if there's any communication from, you know, uh -oh. uh, human noise or yeah, non-terrestrial yeah. entities? Yeah. But you're able to hear that. So I was confused at what do you mean that there's yeah. no sound. So when they, when they say they want to listen, yeah, anytime you, you hear the word listening in astronomy, that mm -hmm. essentially means we're looking for light signals. Um, because 
you know, much like how we use radio to communicate, we can encode sound into light signals. Oh. Uh, yeah, so you can do, the, we're looking to see if anybody else out in the universe is doing that too. They would be communicating using light signal. If they are, like that's how we would detect them, yeah. So have you heard this thing of, say the sun having a sound and and I don't yeah. know, NASA was able, NASA, N-A-S-A, was able <laughs> to record yeah, so I'm not exactly sure how that works, but uh -huh. when I say that there's no sound in space, okay. uh, what I mean is that the, the way that sound works is, you know, for example, uh, take a speaker, for example, a speaker has a little device on it that's literally s like slapping the air really fast. And when you slap the air, um, that causes the air to compress and expand. And when that hits your eardrum, you interpret that as sound. Right. And so for, okay. for sound to work, you need that gassy medium for it to travel through. But as we know, there's no gas in, or gas doesn't exist in space at the, the kind of pressures that we have on Earth. And so any sound that does come from the sun, you know, we just can't hear it because the gas is just too thin. The air, the air in space is just entirely too thin. Um, so when they listen to the sun, what they're really listening to are, you know, bursts of light of you know emissions particle emissions that come from the sun and there are ways that we can sort of correlate you know that to kinds of sounds that are produced um and so that's kind of not that great of an explanation but yeah okay we're not, so we're not actually listening to sounds okay all right but they're they're witnessing something and then they translate it into sound yeah yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I have a, a, a question from uh, Nish, and she says, What does Jordan think about those D wave computers? Yeah. Yeah. What is D wave? I don't even know what that is. Yeah. So this is, so we're shifting gears a little bit here, talking about from gravitational waves and now talking about quantum computing. Um, okay. And this is the research that I'm interested in getting involved with uh, next year. At university. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so I guess before I talk about D-Wave, I should talk about what quantum computing actually is. Okay. Um, and so if we think about computers, you know, how do computers work? Um, a computer is essentially just billions of tiny little on and off switches. Um, okay. And these switches behave by, you know, if you look at the switch, if there's, you know, a little bit of... Uh, if there's some volt, some energy stored in that switch, then we consider it on. If there's no energy in there, we consider it off, right? And so these on switches are ones and the off switches are zeros. And so now we have, you know, this way of reading information from this P this computer chip by this, this string of zeros and ones. If you think about like that, that matrix scene where they have like all the zeros and ones, you know, scrolling up right, and down, right, right. That's, that's what's going on in a computer. It's just, you know, these, um, yeah, just information stored in these zeros and ones, right? Um, and so, you know, a big part of computer science, which is like the science of, you know, how do we use these zeros and ones to like actually do computation to do, to make programs. Um, a big component of that field is how do we make programs that are efficient? How do we solve problems, you know, such as how do we sort a list, for example, a, like sort of list alphabetically. How can we do that in a computationally efficient manner? Which means that we're like sort of maximize or minimizing the amount of time it takes to do that. Are you following along? Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and so there's this field of computer science has been around for, you know, you know, decades. Um, and it, it's, it's been a very successful field. Like obviously we have computers, we have satellite uh, technology, right? Cell phones. Um, <laughs> cell phones, yeah. But there are some kinds of problems that are very hard to solve with just, you know, flicking, flickering zeros and ones. Um, and that's because when you have on and off states, it's very hard to simulate, you know, probability with that, you know, mm -hmm. because um, if something is like on or off, you know, it's either zero or one, you know, you, you can't have, you know, what if it's like half zero and half one, you know? Um, and so the problems, uh, that are inherently probabilistic. For example, when we try to predict the weather, right? We're like, oh, it's like a 50% chance of raining, 
50 percent chance of sunshine you know we in order to like sort of factor that into a computer simulation you know is we can't do that you know super precisely just because these computers don't have you know the a, a capability to be probabilistic mm -hmm. that's the term they use um and so the field of quantum computing helps with this because quantum mechanics is essentially the science of bodies that behave, you know, what, what we call non-deterministically. Um, and what that means is, uh, have you heard of uh, Schrodinger's cat? Like that? Yeah. So Schrodinger's yeah. cat is this, this learning tool that they use to describe quantum mechanics. And what that is about is say we have a, a, a cat inside of a box. We don't know what the cat is doing. We don't know. Uh, we don't know anything about the cat. We just know that there's a cat in there, right? And we drop some poison into the uh, cat, the box. It's you know very inhumane. Nobody's actually done this physically because it's yeah. Um, but if that cat were to behave what we consider to be quantum mechanically, um, there is some uncertainty whether or not that cat has you know succumbed to the poison. And we we don't know if the cat has died until we take a look, until we look inside and actually observe it. And so Schrodinger's cat is essentially, um, until we observe that cat, there's some probability that the cat is alive and there's some probability that the cat is dead. But you won't know until you actually open up the box and look inside. And there are, and that relates to the real world because if we look at small enough objects such as electrons, uh, such as you know some really small atoms, mm -hmm. um, and say like we threw an atom into a box and we like left it alone for a little while. Um, we, there are some things about the atom that we actually just don't know, which is you know how much energy the atom has, uh, where the atom is, um, and so there's some uncertainty, and that's a key right. word of of quantum mechanics is uncertainty that you introduce to the system, um, and so. If we think back to the case of the cat, the cat is either alive or dead, right? If we apply yeah, this to break up. <laughs> sorry, if we think back to the, the example of the cat, the cat is alive, either alive or it's dead. Um, with some probably like it's 50% chance it's alive, 50% right. chance it's dead, right? right. Um, and then if we apply this to computing, you know, we can then represent what's called a bit like that zero or one. Now, instead of being it's either zero or it's either one, now it's either like 50% zero or 50% one, right? And so we've introduced this, this probability into this piece of our computer. Right. And so now that allows us to simulate things that are probabilistic, you know, such as, you know, economic models or the weather or, you know, atoms. Like we actually, one of the, one of the ways that quantum computing, quantum computers are being used nowadays is to simulate you know, molecules, um, because molecules behave yeah. quantum mechanically. And so using quantum mechanical objects, we can simulate quantum mechanical things. Um, okay. And so now with these tools, we can simulate certain kinds of kinds of problems, solve certain kinds of problems more efficiently. Um, mm -hmm. And so what D-Wave is, it's this, comp uh, this company that started uh, 20, sorry, 19 years ago. And they've been building a certain kind of quantum computer that works a certain kind of way. Um, I actually don't know that much about the company. I just know that they they have a quantum computer that is 512 bytes big, um, which is by and large the the far, the biggest that I've read about. Most quantum computers nowadays are around like 32 bytes, which means 32 up and like 32, you know, quantum bits. Um, yeah. Okay. I don't know if that is, is that a good. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have questions that? All right, that was good. I think we got it. You got a little bit more going on in your bandwidth, so it's slowing down. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Because... No, that's okay. That's not your fault. Uh, might have to uh, uh, maybe have a part two. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a little bit earlier on so it looks like we've been gone for an hour now maybe we you know i don't know depends on your schedule maybe we could do an, another segment uh maybe a little bit earlier in the day when there's a little less on the 
on the bandwidth there. I had a couple of questions I wanted to get through. Maybe mm -hmm. can ask you one more question before we let this go. And do you think time travel is plausible, mm -hmm. probable, possible? <laughs> yeah. That's the so, sci-fi geek in me wants yeah. to know that. Yeah. So that's a really good question. So time travel obviously has been a very big part of science fiction. You know, it's been of great interest to us because like, yeah, let's like, let's go back and, you know, fix the things we messed up or, you know, like I want to see what it was like in middle medieval, like France, you know, so like I want to go time travel. Um, but the physics surrounding, you know, the plausibility of time travel is definitely, you know, as long as it's been studied, it's still like in its, you know, it's still very undeveloped. Um, there are certain parts of physics that can allow for something that's analogous to time travel. Um, Wait a minute, I'm sorry, could you say that again? There are certain what? There are certain parts of physical theory that allows for certain kinds of time travel. Um, yeah. Oh, so, okay. This didn't hear you said there's certain parts of physics theory. Did you yeah. say that allow for time travel? Yeah, in a sense. Oh, so for example, wow. I don't know if you've watched the movie Interstellar. Yes. So in Interstellar, um, one of the big plot elements is uh, these these astronauts that are trying to find a new habitable Earth for the the for mankind to occupy. Uh, goes near this this black hole um and remember how i was saying earlier how black holes kind of cause space to warp yes well, they also cause time to warp uh they cause your perception of time to slow down compared to other people's who are a far away from the black hole and so right. a big plot without giving away too much of the story a plot element of the story is while these astronauts are at near this black hole the time or their family people back home or sorry the time back home is going by so much faster so right. while he's like by this planet his his family ages by 20 years while he only aged by a right. few hours um right and so if you think about it like that's kind of he basically time traveled to the future because you know he went by this black hole and when he came back every like time had so much time had passed right right and so right. Um, in that sense, like, yeah, like there, it's plausible to travel into the future. Um, and so you can that's actually fun if you can't come back. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's kind of the thing is that, you know, um, a lot of, a lot of, uh, relativity kind of treats time as another dimension. So we have four dimensions. We have the three dimensional space, three spatial dimensions mm -hmm. and one time dimension, but unlike the spatial dimensions, which travel in both directions. Like I can go this way and this way, this way and this way, this way and this way. So that's six ways to travel in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. Time can only travel in one, one direction, which is forward. Right. Um, and, you know, I'm sure there's people that will like listen to this explanation and be like, you're totally wrong. Um, but again, I'm not like an expert in this field, but um, to, to my knowledge, like time only moves in one direction um by like the physical laws that we have and so to my understanding like rever like traveling back in time is not something that's possible at this point at um this point. and that's just because our understanding of time is so you know so immature right. you know for the longest time we thought that time passes at the same rate everywhere but it turns out if you're by a really big gravitational source time will travel slower for you. So clearly time doesn't travel at the same rate everywhere. Right. But we haven't really observed, we've never observed time traveling backwards. And I don't think there's any theory that um, explains that time can travel backwards. Okay, all right. And, so, before, yeah. and thank you so much, Jordan. And before we bring this to a, a close, I have one last question from Nish. And she wants to know, uh, well, you can either do it now or we could do it next time. She says, for next time, I'm curious about Jordan's opinion of alternate realities 
uh, alternate dimensions, like, you know, what was explored in Fringe. Did you ever watch Fringe? Mm -hmm. So do you think alternate realities, alternate dimensions are probable? Yeah, uh, that's also another very cool topic. Um, uh, there is a very large, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, efforts being made by the physics community to tackle this question of the universe versus the multiverse. Um, actually, Stephen Hawking's last paper before he passed away dealt with, you know, the plausibility of a multiverse. Um, you know, how big is our universe? Is it infinite? Is it finitely contained? You know, these are all questions that are being actively tackled. Um, and one of the one of the things that we can you know, sort of relate, relate to the plausibility of the multiverse is quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, because like I said, quantum mechanics deals with probabilities, right? We right. open the box for the cat, you know, there's a 50% chance that it's alive, 50% chance that it's dead. Mm -hmm. And so say that we open that, the box and the cat is dead. And we're, mm -hmm. we're very sad we have a funeral for the cat. But what if in some alternate reality, they open the box and the cat's alive? Um, and so uh, it's, it's, from my understanding, it's been sort of like this, well, why not? Why can't that be the case? Why can't there be every time we have this, this interaction with quantum mechanics that the alternate to what we've experienced like happens in another you know, reality? Mm -hmm. And so like the multiverse arising from quantum mechanics is like a field of active study. Um, wow. I'm, trying, I'm just trying to think of other examples. Well, um, you know, and I'm thinking if that is a field that people are studying on some level, there is this understanding or theory or belief that it's possible or probable that there, that time or whatever you would call it would branch off and that there is another, there is an alternate reality to what we're yeah. dealing with. And the closest I can get to that is I remember when I was maybe about 11 years old and I remember walking down the street one day and I was thinking and the thought came to my mind was that the past and the future and the present were all happening right now. And I just imagined that there were elements of the past and elements of the future coexisting in the same space that I was standing in, but that the only thing that was separating it all was, you know, sort of like a veil, sort of like dimensions, but it was all happening mm -hmm. together. At this, yeah. Is there a theory for that in physics? <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, our understanding of time is uh, very limited. Um, right. There are, you know, for there is, you know, as as objects, we exist in space and we exist in time. There are some objects, such as black holes, for example, that exhibit very strange behavior. Um, and like maybe we could talk about this next time. Um, but that behavior comes out of the fact that they are bodies in space time. Um, for example. When we have two black holes that merge, you know, if we look at the black holes before they merge, they were two distinct objects, mm -hmm. but they came together at some point and combined into one object. Mm -hmm. And after that, they're one object. But if you look at that black hole as existing in space and time, the black hole was always one object. Because if you think about time as a spatial dimension, you know, now you have kind of like this Y shape. Or if you look at it in earlier times, you have two kind of black holes that come together and form to form one object, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you think about time being that fourth dimension, you like really weird things come out, like objects sort of being connected where they previously weren't. Um, you know, like, like how does this concept of a space-time continuum, you know, affect our interpretation of our world? And like, that's like an active, field of, I, I believe that falls under cosmology, um, which is sort of this very abstract theoretical branch of physics that asks questions like, what is the Big Bang? What happened before the Big Bang? You know, what is our universe? You know, right. all these very zany, crazy out there questions that are, you know, very, very important to understand because, you know, that gives us, you know, more context, context to, you know, why are we here? Like what, it, you know, what is the universe? Um, so it's, it's a really exciting field. 
Okay. Um, I recommend to all your, your viewers, if you want to kind of learn more about these topics, you should look at, go onto youtube.com mm -hmm. and look up the series of videos called Min Minute Physics. Minute uh, Physics. Okay. Yeah. And there's this guy who breaks down a lot of these, you know, these really cool physics topics into two or three minute cartoons where he animates, you know, these concepts. And he talks about time travel. Um, yeah. He talks about gravitation waves. He talks about, you know, the Schrodinger's cat, you know? And so just, you can honestly spend all night on that channel learning all these cool things. And I strongly recommend it because there's so much of that in physics, you know, that, you know, relates to, you know, not just technology and science, but also like spirituality, for example. Wow. You know, these, uh, and so it, it's really cool to explore and to explore through, through multiple lenses. Um, so like, I really encourage you, your listeners to go check that out. It's called Minute Physics. It's on YouTube. Yeah. Wow. That was really awesome. <laughs> and so you, we will be able to get you back on? Another yeah, time? of course. Okay, awesome, cool. So there will be a part two. And I encourage anyone, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, if you email those questions to me, and um, then the next time when uh, uh, Jordan is able to make time in his schedule to come on the show, then I will ask him uh, these questions. And uh, Jordan, I thank you so much for being here. And so if I watch, is it Minute Physics, you said? Yep. Yes. So if I watch Minute Physics, will I be as smart as you? <laughs> of course. Okay, very cool. Very uh, all of these, all of these, you know, concepts, you know, they, they look scary at first. Mm -hmm. um, but there are ways that you can, you know, build that intuition, right? Into right. understanding it. And it takes time, but you can definitely get there. And, you know, minute physics is a great way to start because they, they, they get your mind, you know, kind of get those kind of gears turning, like those physics gears. And so I, I strongly recommend checking that out. Um, if you want to learn like the math that is behind this stuff, you can go on Khan Academy where he will like basically break down all of these math concepts for you. Mm -hmm. um, documentaries like the universe, like, uh carl sagan's uh what's this show called the cosmos yeah <laughs> and uh uh yeah there, there's so many resources and you know so yeah get out there and check it out and it, it's it's a really great time and it's as you can see for yourself it's really exciting and mind-blowing I, I yeah i just strongly recommend you check it out so yeah and and you know what i thought was really cool is how as you were wrapping this up and bringing it roundabout that you mentioned that you know through the discussion of physics and through working through all of this it sort of leads you into spirituality mm -hmm. That's yeah yeah it's um yeah it, i think it's 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 very important to keep an open mind when you know looking at physics just because all of the if all of the great discoveries that have happened you know ever have come from somebody essentially going against the grain and sort of questioning outside of the box and mm -hmm. so you know trying to draw parallels between what has been established and you know what you bring it as a unique observer to the situation you know could could shed new light on the situation so um yeah, I think I think it's great when people try to, you know, uh, draw these these sort of connections. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jordan, for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to come on to the show. And you know, please, guys, don't think just because I'm mom, I get first dibs. No, I get on the waiting list. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate that. Appreciate you, and I wish you all the best um, Thank you. on your journey and the places that you're going to continue to go. And, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you encourage people that you have yourself and that you encourage people to have an open mind and you know to not be afraid to go against the grain and think outside of the box and to hold space for the possibilities of possibilities.
yeah, yeah. So, and I also like to thank uh, the wonderful people in the live chat room for all of your great questions. And we're going to go ahead and um, bring this video to a close. But before I do, I wanted to give a quick shout out to uh, Big Liz, Big Liz, Big Liz Conjure.com. She created this amazing, whoops, she created this amazing um, flower of life, sacred geometry circle. And you can write your, it's chalkboard backing, so you can write your intentions on the backside and put your crystals in alignment however you want for whatever manifestation, whatever you want to do. And you can find these on Big Liz Conjure. Dot com. So I want to take a moment to thank everyone for being here. Thanks again to Jordan. We can thank take you guys. A thank you. Uh, if we can take a moment to remember our ancestors and to remember all those who have transitioned before us. So thank you. I wish you peace and great bliss.